What's up, Sojourn family? Thank you so much for joining us today in this online gathering. We're praying for you that you experience the love and the nearness of Jesus. We're praying that the Holy Spirit comforts you and even challenges you where you need it and that we as a church family can come around one another and support one another even as we're distant from one another. So enjoy today's service and we pray that you enjoy Jesus.
What's up, Sojourn? We are so grateful for you joining us today for this online service. Thank you so much for uh, being with us as we're in our second sermon in our Justice and Mercy series. And before we dive in, let me share a couple of thoughts with you. And you know it's going to be a great sermon series when you have to start with pre-qualifying statements. So first, know that we will not be able to tackle every part of this conversation in the couple of weeks that we're going to be in this sermon series, and know that we're also not trying to. We are prayerfully asking the Lord to help us know what we specifically need to talk about in this series, but also know that this will not be the last time that we talk about how we as Christians should engage in social issues. Second, be prepared to not agree with everything in this sermon series. You know, I have read a lot of folks that I respect a ton on this topic, and at least once, if not multiple times in everything that I've read or listened to, uh, I find myself not agreeing with everything. So know that this means that there will most likely be at least something in this sermon series that offends you. And if that happens, I just encourage you, talk to the Lord, ask him, why does that offend me? Ask the Lord to reveal uh, what you need to do in light of that. And ultimately, let's choose love and compassion for one another. Third, as Pastor James said last week, the basis of our pursuit And our understanding of justice and mercy has to be found in God. And if you missed his sermon series, his sermon last week, I would highly encourage you to go back and check that out. But that idea that our, that our pursuit of justice and mercy has to be grounded in God is what we're really going to focus in on and drill down deep into today. Before we ever talk about uh, racial reconciliation or racial injustice, we must have a deep understanding of what it means for God to be both just and and merciful. We also need to have an understanding of how we as the church should talk through controversial issues. So our big idea for the day is God is just and we should seek justice and mercy. And to keep things really simple today, those are going to be our two points. Point one, God is just. Point two, we should seek justice and mercy. So if you have your Bibles, turn with me to Exodus Chapter 34, we're going to read verses 5 to 7 to kick this off. Here we go, Sojourn. Hear the word of the Lord, and feel free to respond with the underlined portion. The Lord descended in the cloud and stood with Moses there and proclaimed the name of the Lord. The Lord passed before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, but who will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children and the children's children to the third and the fourth generation. Sojourn, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. God, thank you for your word that tells us who you are, what you are like, and then calls us to live and to love like you. I pray that you would help us as a church to do this. Pray that you'd help us to see you clearly for who you are. Pray that you'd help us to live and love in the same ways that you live and love us. And we pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so first, we're going to look at the the fact that God is just and merciful. Now, for this year, we've been in our Revelation series, taking a break from that right now for this series. But if you've been tracking with that series, you know that there is a lot in the book of Revelation about God's justice, about God's judgment. And you might find yourself asking, how can this judging God also be a loving God? And in addition to that, if you look at what's going on in our culture Right now, the cries for justice, the protests, the riots over racial injustice, you might be asking yourself, how does God's justice and mercy apply to these specific situations? And my point here is that our answer to how God's justice and mercy fit together is very important because our answer to that shapes the way we view the scriptures as we've seen in Revelation. It also shapes the way that we interact with our culture, as we've seen with what's going on in our society right now. So it's an important 
question. And I would argue that we instinctually think incorrectly about God's justice and his mercy. If we are really honest with ourselves, most of us gutturally, instinctually believe that God is quick to judge and that he is slow to mercy. Even think about the way many Christians define the term mercy. Uh, You've certainly heard this before. The definition of mercy is not getting the punishment that we deserve. And while that is true, do you hear the emphasis on justice and judgment in our definition of mercy? (laughs) There's not even the word compassion or the word forgiveness in the way that we most commonly and regularly talk about mercy. So Moses is there before the Lord, and he asks God, show me your glory. Uh, Moses is saying, I want to know who you are. I want to see you clearly. I want to know the full weight of who you are. Show me who you are, God. And God passes by him, and he proclaims his name, and the first thing out of God's mouth is, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. Now, this is not to say that God is not just, because remember verse 7, that goes on to say, but who will by no means clear the guilty? visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children and the children's children to the third and the fourth generation. So God is both just and merciful. He cannot be anything else. God hears the cries of the oppressed, as the scriptures tell us. God will bring justice to the oppressor, as the scriptures tell us. But Sojourn, what is the bent of God's heart? What is God's deepest desire for humanity? Did you notice in Exodus 34 that while it describes God as both merciful and just, that those descriptions were lopsided? God will show loving kindness, as we could translate this verse, to thousands of generations, while his anger lasts for but a couple of generations. God is slow to anger. He is abounding in love and mercy, and the rest of the Bible makes this same conclusion. Do you remember from several months ago our Lamentations series? And if you remember from that, uh, you'll recall that Lamentations chapter 3, verse 33, is the very dead center of the book. And in the center of a book that's all about grief, suffering, and lament, there we get the heart of God. And this is what it says in Lamentations 3, verse 33. It says, For God does not afflict, and this is so important, from his heart, or grieve the children of men. Or consider Isaiah chapter 28, verse 21, that talks about God's judgment. And this is what Isaiah says, For the Lord will rise up as on Mount Perizim, as in the valley of Gibeon. He will be roused. Sojourn, the Lord will rise up against the oppressor. But Isaiah goes on to say, to do his deed, strange is his deed, and to work his work, alien is his work. Finally, consider Jeremiah 32, verse 41, and how it describes God's mercy. It says, I, God, will rejoice in doing them good. And I will plant them in this land in faithfulness. And this part is so important. With all my heart and all my soul. Friends, the Bible is clear that God's justice is a strange work, as Isaiah chapter 28 tells us. But God's mercy, it overflows out of his heart And it is the most natural thing for him to do. And this is why the Bible often talks about God being provoked to anger. But you never hear the Bible saying God must be provoked to love. 
or that God must be provoked to mercy. No, he abounds in mercy and love. God is just. Yes, he is. For him not to bring justice would mean that he denies who he is, which he cannot do because he would cease to be God. But sojourn, even as we think about that, pay attention to how you think about God. God's deepest desire is mercy. He'd rather take our judgment on the cross than place it upon us. And at this point, I hope and I pray for you that you are feeling awe and wonder over who God is But you might be sitting here thinking, what does this have to do with what's going on in our world right now? You might even be so angry, and I'd say rightfully so, over unjust murders that in this moment, you desire justice more than mercy. And what do we do with that? This leads us to our second point, that we should seek justice and mercy. And here's the catch, as those who image God. Who God is here at this point is deeply challenging to us. Remember that God will by no means clear the guilty, as Exodus 34 verse 7 says, but also remember that God is much slower to anger than we are. Dane Ortland, in his amazing book, uh, Gentle and Lowly, I would highly recommend you pick it up, you read it, you listen to it. He says this, We tend to think divine anger is pent up, spring-loaded. Divine mercy is slow to build. It's just the opposite. (laughs) Divine mercy is ready to burst forth at the slightest pinprick. (laughs) For fallen humans, we learn in the New Testament, this is reversed. We are to provoke one another to love according to, to Hebrews 10, 24, God needs no provoking to love, only to anger. We need no provoking to anger, only to love. Once again, the Bible is one long attempt to deconstruct our natural vision of who God actually is. Friends, God is the one who showered mercy on Saul, who became the Apostle Paul when he was the oppressor who was unjustly killing God's people. Jesus is the one who took our judgment in order to satisfy God's justice so that God might show us mercy. This is what your God is like. Be absolutely amazed by him and know that we too are called to live like him. God is just. God is merciful. And as image bearers, we can and we even should mirror these attributes in the same way that God displays these attributes. Sojourn, are you angry? Are you angry at the unjust murders of black men and women in our country? good. You should be. Are you angry over unjust systems that do not promote equality for all? Good. You should be. Are you angry over racism, either overt or this subtle racism that plagues minority cultures and that is just wrecking our country and making their experience not the same experience of the majority culture. If you're angry over that, good, you should be. But sojourn, does your anger over injustice move beyond the injustice and turn into a toxic, deep-seated bitterness against our president, against our government, against liberals or conservatives, against the church, or even against fellow sojourners who think differently than you? Does your anger over injustice lose sight of a heart posture that desires 
mercy for all. Or on the flip side of that, does your heart ache so much for mercy that you overlook justice? (laughs) You just want everyone to quote unquote get along and you don't create the space to actually process with the Lord the experiences of others in our country because of the uncomfortableness of the conflict around you. You don't want to feel that internally, and so you ignore what's going on. Friends, it dishonors God and it dishonors other people when we pursue justice without mercy. It also dishonors God and other people when we pursue mercy without justice because God displays both of these attributes and we should too. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9 tells us that God is patient in bringing justice because he doesn't want anyone to perish and he wants all to be saved. But the very next verse tells us that the day of judgment is coming. You can count on it, sojourn. And next week, we'll get more into the details of personal versus corporate sin in terms of racism and how justice and mercy can be applied to those situations. But before we get to that, we as a church need to learn how to talk. Sojourn, part of our dream for this church was that we could gather folks from all different places in life and that we could all find love, joy, and peace as we live under the banner of the gospel of Jesus, that that different types of people with different colored skin, with different ages, with different political beliefs, and with all the other controversial stuff that we can argue about, that we can all come together and say we can live with each other, we can love one another, we can be humble and kind and generous to one another because we have Jesus in common. And this gospel freedom is what we talk about in our membership class. And if you are a member, you've agreed to this. Friends, this moment is where the rubber meets the road. (laughs) Sojourners, some of you are vilifying other sojourners based on your political leanings, and it has to stop. That's not how the church of Jesus is supposed to behave. You see posts of fellow sojourners online, and rather than engaging them in conversations, you cast judgment on them as being too conservative or too liberal. And please hear me, people are so much more complex than that. (laughs) And biblical Christianity does not fit neatly into either conservatism or liberalism. Sojourn, hear me, we need one another in all of our differences. So the next time you find yourself tempted to judge a fellow sojourner or you find yourself judging a fellow sojourner or lumping them into a group that does not include the group of my sojourn family united by faith in Jesus, right? Next time that happens, remember this. We do not need help being provoked to anger. That comes naturally for us as people. What we need is Hebrews chapter 10, verse 24, that says, And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and to good works. So rather than naturally judging one another as our proclivity is, let's be provoked ourselves first, provoked to love, provoked to listen to others, knowing that We can love them even if we don't fully agree with them. And knowing that the body of Christ is made up of all different types of people and parts so that together we might grow up into maturity. Friends, as we wrap up today, you might be disappointed that before we can talk about race and reconciliation, that we have to first talk about God and how we as the church should talk about controversial issues. But hey, that's just where we are, and we can't be anywhere other than where we are. And also, when you look at the Bible, uh, that's also just the way it's always been. 
Uh, if we think about passages like Ephesians chapter 2, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 8, we see there that when conversations around racial tensions came up in the church, biblical authors immediately started talking about God. <laughs> And they grounded the church in who God is. And then they said, out of the overflow of God's characteristics, you church should now live life and talk through these controversial issues with those same characteristics. God has loved you, so you should love one another. God has been patient with you, you should be patient with one another. God has approached you in humility, you should approach one another in humility. God has forgiven you. You should forgive one another. And friends, I cannot think of any better time for us to lean into our values as a church that we have drawn from the scriptures. Those values of truth. Will we speak the truth even when it's uncomfortable? The value of humility, that God is God and that we are not, and that you know what? Even though we think we're right, we may not be right on every point. Transformation. Are we willing to ask Jesus to change our own hearts? And are we willing to pursue change in our culture knowing that ultimately true and lasting change only comes from Jesus? For compassion, will we love as we've been loved by Jesus, which is overflowing and abounding with merciful compassion at every opportunity? Five, empowerment. Will we cling to Christ in our weakness? And will we use our God-given strength to help others who are in need. Recently, I asked an African-American friend, what do you think the church needs to hear right now in this moment? And this is what my friend said. He said, know that you'll get it wrong. Know that you will offend people as you get it wrong. But ultimately, that fear of offending should not keep the church from talking about race. Sojourn, let's create a mercy-filled and abounding with compassion-filled culture where we can talk about justice issues freely, knowing that we are deeply united in Jesus, that we have his love, we have his joy, we have his peace, and nothing will change that. Let us be able to create a culture where we can, out of an overflow of mercy, talk about hard things, knowing that God is just and merciful, and knowing that we too should seek justice and mercy. I hope you'll join us next week as we continue the conversation.
All right, Sojourn family, thank you so much for being with us today. Know that we love you, know that we're praying for you. And uh, two quick announcements before we go here. First, we have a lot of exciting changes coming up this fall in the life of our church. And if you want to be up to date on all of the information that we're putting out on that, be sure to check out our new podcast, Sojourn Discipleship, where myself, Pastor Mark, Pastor in Training, Nick Pacureri, uh, we talk through all the changes that are coming. So you can find that on whatever your favorite podcast source is. It's called Sojourn Discipleship. Uh, second thing, as we continue this sermon series on justice and mercy, know also that uh, we're sending out emails to you as our church family, helping you process uh, the racial tensions going on in our country and what biblical racial reconciliation looks like. So be sure that you're getting those emails. Be sure that you're setting aside time to prayerfully work through those emails. Uh, Please hop back over to the email that you got for this service and continue your worship through giving uh, and also through praying and through letting us know if there's any way that we as a church can serve you by filling out that loving your neighbor form. We love you, Sojourn. Peace be with you.